Merry Christmas! Christmas Bells by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Read for LibriVox.org For Christmas 2006 by Annie Coleman I heard the bells on Christmas Day Their old, familiar carols play And wild and sweet the words repeat Of peace on earth, good will to men And thought how, as the day had come The belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, good will to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day, a voice, a chime, a chant sublime, of peace on earth, good will to men. Then from each black accursed mouth the cannon thundered in the south, and with the sound the carols drowned of peace on earth, good will to men. It was as if an earthquake rent the hearthstones of a continent and made forlorn the households born of peace on earth, good will to men. And in despair I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, good will to men. Then pealed the bells, more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. With peace on earth, good will to men. Hello friends, I'm Trek Reef, moderator of The Meeting House. The Unitarian poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote the poem, I heard the bells on Christmas day, during the American Civil War. Longfellow lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and he attended the First Parish Unitarian Church in Cambridge. He taught literature for 17 years at Harvard University. Longfellow hated the American Civil War. It tore at the very fiber of his being to see the United States of America, a nation which his family had fought to create and help build, divided by the war. His oldest son, 19-year-old Lieutenant Charles Appleton Longfellow, was severely wounded and sent home to recover. As Longfellow intended his son's injuries, and as he saw other wounded soldiers on Cambridge's streets, he visited with families who lost sons in battle. He probably wrote the poem, I Hear the Bells on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day in 1863. Longfellow's 19th century Unitarian faith in the power of God and people to join and transcend war gave birth to this poem. Inspired by hearing out the ringing of the Christmas bells. Although we do not know the real date of the birth of Jesus, most Unitarian Universalists still love to celebrate Christmas. Tonight, I'd like to share some of the contributions that Unitarian Universalists have made to the celebration of the Christmas holiday. Long ago, the Puritans came to this country. They banned Christmas. At that time in England, Christmas was nothing like the Christmas we celebrate today. It was a wild public party, much like Mardi Gras. People drank. They shot off gunpowder and fireworks. They made a nuisance of themselves. This style of frivolity and celebration had an ancient history. When the Roman rulers were trying to convince their people to be Christian and not pagan, they announced that Jesus' birthday would be in, celebrated in December, the time when Romans celebrated Saturn with over a week of wild partying called Saturnalium. Later, as Christianity moved north, the celebration of Jesus' birth got mixed up with other winter celebrations, like the Celtic Yule. These holidays also had an emphasis on a party. We still celebrate this Christmas in some ways, and the famous Welsh carol, Deck the Halls, is an example of the enduring celebration of the Yule traditions. 
The Puritans understood the pagan roots of Christmas, noted that the Bible never mentioned celebrating Jesus' birthday, and insisted that everyone should just simply ignore it. In 1621, when some of the colony's newer residents tried to take Christmas Day off, the governor ordered them back to work. Thirty years later, the General Court of Massachusetts declared the celebration of Christmas to be a criminal offense. For nearly 150 years, celebrating Christmas was illegal in New England. But by the 1800s, things had changed. Now, in the southern parts of the United States, people had been celebrating Christmas with public partying, and so had the new immigrants who were settling up in New England. Christmas was a great day for the local pubs. Additionally, by the early 1800s, Puritans no longer had the moral and political authority to hold Christmas off. They were no longer a unified group and had divided into conservative and liberal factions. And it was the liberal Puritans who were on the verge of becoming Unitarians who began to call for the public observance of Christmas. I hope when you look at a Christmas tree, you might think of a Unitarian named Charles Fallen. Charles Fallen was not the first German immigrant to set up a Christmas tree in the United States. Nevertheless, Reverend Fallen's tree was one of the first. He set up his tree on New Year's Eve in 1835. Charles Fallen, who now has a church named after him in Lexington, was a German intellectual and political liberal who fled Germany when the authorities wanted to imprison him for his political activities. He moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he formed close ties with the liberal Unitarian establishment that dominated Harvard and Boston. He found Unitarianism very compatible with his own progressive Christianity. In 1830, five years after his arrival in America, Fallon became a Unitarian minister, establishing a beautiful church in Lexington, and became a U.S. citizen, when he was then appointed by Harvard to a full-time faculty position. Fallon helped organize a Cambridge Anti-Slavery Society based at Harvard as well. In November of 1835, a woman by the name of Harriet Martineau came to visit Fallon. Born in 1802, Harriet Martineau was a prominent English Unitarian intellectual. She was visiting the United States to write a book about our country. She met and quickly befriended Charles Fallon, and he invited her to spend New Year's Eve with him and his family. When Martineau arrived at the Fallon's home December 31st, 1835, Charles and his wife were just adding the seven dozen little wax candles to the Christmas tree. The Fallons had postponed their ritual until New Year's Eve to adapt to Martineau's schedule. The tree, a top portion of a fir or spruce, had been placed in the front drawing room of the house. A toy hung from every branch. As five-year-old Charlie and two older companions approached the house, the adults quickly closed the door to the front drawing room. They moved into an adjacent room where, as Harriet Martineau put it, they sat around, quote, trying to look as if nothing was going to happen, end quote. After they served the visitors tea and coffee, they played a round of parlor games. The goal was to distract the children's attention away from the front drawing room, where Charlie's parents were now busy lighting the candles. Finally, they threw open the double doors and the children poured in. Their voices instantaneously hushed. Martineau wrote, their faces were turned to the blaze, all eyes wide open, lips parted, all steps arrested. Nobody spoke. Only Charlie leaped for joy. After a few moments, the children discovered that the tree, quote, bore something eatable, end quote, and the babble began again. The, children told the, the adults told the children to take what they could from the tree without burning themselves in the candles. In fact, Martino reported that we tall people kept watch and helped them with good things from the higher branches. After the children had eaten their fill of the edibles on the tree, the evening continued with dancing and mugs of steaming mulled wine. When she returned to London, Harriet Martineau wrote about Charles Fallon's Christmas tree in a widely read book published in 1838. She said in the book that 
she was present at the introduction into this new country of the German Christmas tree. So the next time you see one, a Christmas tree that is, remember it was a Unitarian who displayed one of the first Christmas trees in America, helping publicize the custom and making it a tradition of his adoptive homeland. Well, helping introduce the Christmas tree to Americans is not our only contribution to Christmas. A Unitarian is also responsible for one of the most popular Christmas carols. Can you guess what it is? James Pierpont was born in 1822, while his father served as the Unitarian pastor of the Hollis Street Church in Boston. In 1832, at the age of 10, his parents sent James to a boarding school in New Hampshire. An adventurous child, he wrote his mother a letter about riding in a sleigh through the November snow. In 1836, 14 year old James ran away to a sea aboard a ship called the Shark. By 1845, James was back on the East Coast, where his father was the minister of a Unitarian congregation in Troy, New York. In 1849, his father accepted a position as minister of the Unitarian Church in Medford, Massachusetts. Son James sailed to San Francisco to participate in the California Gold Rush of 1849. He opened a business in San Francisco, but when the store burned down by a fire, James returned to live with his father in Medford. In 1853, James's brother, the Reverend John Pierpont Jr., accepted a post with the Savannah, Georgia Unitarian Congregation. James followed, taking a post as the organist and music director of the church. Both the Unitarian Church in Medford, Massachusetts, and the Unitarian Church in Savannah, Georgia claim that they are the location where James wrote what was to become the most popular Christmas carol in America. The Medford, Massachusetts Unitarians say that one day in 1851, James Pierpont went to the home of Mrs. Otis Waterman. She let him play a piano belonging to William Weber, a Medford music teacher. Mrs. Waterman owned a boarding house, which became better known later as the Simpson Tavern. Hence the origin of the story that James wrote the song in a tavern. After he played the piece for her, Mrs. Waterman replied that it was a very merry little jingle and he should have much success with it. Do you know the song yet? Pierpont then wrote lyrics about the one horse open sleighs that young men raced around on the one mile route from Medford to Malden Squares after Thanksgiving. The Unitarians in Savannah, Georgia, however, believe that he wrote the Christmas Carol in Savannah. They believe that James composed the song because he was homesick for snow and nostalgic about his youthful days in New England. Both the Unitarians in Massachusetts and the Unitarians in Georgia say that James played the carol for the first time at a Thanksgiving church service in the 1850s. According to the story, the children liked the Thanksgiving Carol so much that they asked for James to repeat it at the Christmas service. However, others argue that the references in the carol to courting and racing would not have been acceptable in a church service of the time. So it was probably just a song about fast sleighs and pretty girls. Today, in both Medford, Massachusetts and Savannah, Georgia, historical markers commemorate the birthplace of the carol. Wherever James originally wrote it, we do know that he was a Unitarian. Also, we know that he copyrighted it in 1857 with the memorable title, One Horse Open Sleigh. So friends, the next time you hear, Dashing through the snow in a one horse open sleigh, O'er the fields we go, laughing all the way, Ha ha ha, bells on bobtails ring, Making spirits bright, what fun it is to ride and sing a sleighing song tonight. Remember, it was a Unitarian music director who wrote it. At this time, I'd like to take a small pause from our stories. I keep talking about Unitarian Universalists, Unitarian Universalism, Unitarians, Universalists. Well, who are we? What do we even believe? What is it we do? We're going to take a quick break for this uh, short video that tells you a little bit more about Unitarian Universalism 
and what we believe. We are Unitarian Universalists. We are people of many paths who are brave, curious, and compassionate thinkers and doers. Every day, people are inundated with information, overwhelmed by demands, and pulled by a culture that seeks to divide us from the web of life. Unitarian Universalism reconnects, bringing people together with meaning and inspiration. We are a house without walls, a congregation without spiritual limits, and a movement that calls you to put more faith in yourself, your community, and your beliefs. We are a faith that honors your mind, your heart, your journey. Simply put, we are a guided path towards a better you and a better world. Grounded in hundreds of years of thoughtful religious communities, we are people of many generations, ethnicities, genders and sexualities, and spiritual backgrounds. People engaged in making the world a better place. People focusing on what really matters, love, justice, integrity, and hope. Unitarian Universalists have different beliefs, but shared values. We are Unitarian Universalists, and at the same time, we may also be agnostic, Buddhist, Christian, Hindu, humanist, Jewish, Muslim, pagan, atheist, believers in God, and those who let the great mystery be. The diversity of beliefs you'll find in a Unitarian Universalist community is one of our strengths. We're always learning how to see the world from a different perspective. What unites us are our core principles that uphold seven real world values, believing in the worthiness of every person, showing compassion and fairness, accepting others for who they are, growing through a personal search for truth, leading with democratic spirit, working for justice, and understanding that everything is interconnected. Seven days a week, Unitarian Universalists live these principles by doing. When we gather, we worship, reflect, and remind ourselves what matters most in life. Whatever our age, we learn to live with more wisdom, more awareness, more gratitude, and more soul. We show our values by showing up to answer the call for social justice. We have a track record of standing on the side of love for civil rights, LGBTQ equality, immigration reform, environmental sustainability, reproductive justice, racial justice, and more. Find what it means to live your deepest values out loud. Join us on this extraordinary adventure of faith. Helping introduce the Christmas tree to Americans and writing jingle bells are not the only Unitarian Universalist contributions to Christmas. A third example is a story written by the Englishman Charles Dickens. Traditional religion disgusted Charles Dickens. He watched clergy engage in intellectual debates about the Bible as children were dying of disease and malnutrition in the slums. Dickens said, I cannot sit under a, congress, a clergyman who addresses his congregation as though he had taken a return ticket to heaven and back. I guess congressmen would work fit today. He detested the practice of teaching poor children to memorize parts of the Bible by rote. And he was delighted with the story of a child who came out with, Our Savior was the only forgotten son of the Father. <laughs> In 1842, Dickens traveled to America. He returned to home full of enthusiasm for New England Unitarians. After he returned to London, he first attended Unitarian services at Essex Street Chapel. And then he later bought a pew at the Little Portland Street Chapel. He liked the chapel's minister, and they remained friends until the minister's death. 16 years later. Dickens said, I have carried into effect an old idea of mine and joined the Unitarians who would do something for human improvement if they could and practice charity and toleration. Dickens defined Unitarianism as that religion which has sympathy for men of every creed and ventures to pass judgment on none. 
In October of 1843, while he was most active at Portland Street Chapel, Dickens created the first and greatest of his Christmas books, A Christmas Carol. The tale has become one of the most popular and enduring Christmas stories of all time. The story's popularity played a critical role in redefining the importance of Christmas and the major sentiments associated with the holiday even today. So the next time you watch a play or watch Scrooged, or hear a reading based on Charles Dickens's A Christmas Carol. Remember that Dickens was attending a Unitarian church in London, the little Portland Chapel, when he was writing the story. I have one last example, and it is a carol written by Edmund Hamilton Sears. After briefly studying law, Sears changed career plans and entered Harvard Divinity School, graduating in 1837. He was ordained to the Unitarian ministry and held four pastorates during his lifetime. He had no ambition to pastor large or influential city churches, but was content to serve small congregations and farming communities. Kind of sounds like me. Today we remember Sears for his carol, It Came Upon the Midnight Clear. Some say the carol was first performed by parishioners gathered in his home on Christmas Eve in the 1840s. Another account says he wrote the carol for the Sunday School of the Unitarian Church in Quincy, Massachusetts. In those days, people did not sing carols in church. They thought the new carols were inappropriately childish or secular, not serious like the old hymns such as, O come, all ye faithful, and people had not written many carols yet. It came upon the midnight clear first appeared in print in 1849, in the Unitarian magazine, The Christian Register, back when Unitarians were Christians. The Christian Register's editor, a fellow clergyman, wrote sometime later, I always feel that however poor my Christmas sermon may be, the reading and singing of this hymn are enough to make up for all deficiencies. You see, Sears's song focuses not on Bethlehem, but on his own time and the issue of war and peace. Historians have assumed that it was Sears' response to the just-ended Mexican-American War. Sears' pacifism would take second place to his commitment to abolishing slavery in the Civil War, however. But his carol remains, repeated all over the world every year. It says that the call to peace and goodwill to all is as loud on any other day as it was on that midnight of old, if we would but listen in solemn stillness. The carol shows the author's skillful use of poetry and imagery, as in harps of gold, the world in solemn stillness lay. And a reference to God as heaven's all-gracious king. The second stanza is highly descriptive of the angelic choir, while the third and fifth stanzas take on a political tone with descriptions and intimations of the future golden age of peace. Those who suffer injustice are encouraged to hear the angels sing, and the carol never mentions Jesus. Over 150 years later, we still admire and sing this carol by this Unitarian minister. One scholar wrote, No Christmas is perfect without the singing of this hymn. It is one of the finest ever written, not only because of its melodious rendering of the biblical story of angels and shepherds, but because it is one of the first to emphasize the social significance of the angel's message. I hope you enjoyed hearing these stories of how certain customs came to be American customs for the Christmas tradition, and all thanks to the influence of our local New England Unitarians and Universalists. If you would like a truly Unitarian Universalist Christmas experience, I would like to invite you personally to visit First Parish Unitarian Universalist Church on Billerica Common on Monday, December 24th, 7 p.m., for a special UU retelling of the Christmas story. Our candlelight service begins at 7 o'clock p.m., and all are welcome. In the meantime, a generous donor has given us a $50 gift certificate for a choice of local eateries. We will be announcing in January a contest involving greening up our beautiful town. Stay tuned when we return on January 7th for details. I hope for peace on earth, goodwill to all, and for each of you to have a truly beautiful, blessed,
holiday season. Happy New Year.